Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Tuesdays, um, which is a monthly webinar offered by the Washington State Library, which this month happens to be on the second Tuesday, just to confuse everything, but it's because of the 4th of July holiday. Um, let's see here. I'm not doing this very well. There we are. So next slide. I am your facilitator. My name is Nona Burling. I work at the State Library. And um, for technical support today, we have Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar. And if the two of you wouldn't mind putting contact information into the chat box, if anyone is having any trouble with the software, you can send them a message or give them a call and they can help you figure it out. Since we've switched to our um, Zoom software, we found that it's usually pretty straightforward, but we do want to help you if that is, if anyone's having trouble. So I did want to um, tell you that this webinar is brought to you by the Washington State Library and our funder, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which we're very grateful for. Um, and at the end of the webinar, when you close out the window, you'll find open on your browser a survey. It's just a simple four question survey. We'd love it if you could take the time to fill it out. It shouldn't take you long. This is um, information that helps us with the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So I would ask if you can take the time to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we're really excited today to have Beverly Chaldko Devlin from Tacoma Public Library here to talk about a rather horrific experience that happened to them and the amazingly great way that they handled it. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Beverly. Um, Beverly is the manager of the main library of the Tacoma Public Library. Prior to moving to Puget Sound five years ago, she served as the customer and information services manager for the three county mid york library system in upstate new york she was a library automation specialist for the five county madison oneida board of cooperative education and the director of the morrisville public library in morrisville new york i was just saying to her before we started the webinar that her resume kind of blows me away so anyway she also has served as an adjunct professor for both online and face-to-face -face graduate courses at Syracuse University iSchool for 10 years. Her courses included Information Resources Technology Government Documents, which she co-taught, Reference and Online Resources, and Summer Institute electives. Her career also included being elected to many leadership and board positions in the New York Library Association, including Public, the public library section, the section on management of information, resources, and technology, the section on school librarians, as well as on several boards of the Central New York Library Resources Council. She was the recipient of the 2007 Leadership Mohawk Valley Award, and she's testified before Senate and House committees on the role of public libraries in ensuring equity of access to information in the digital age. She believes passionately in the role that libraries serve in the capacity to change people's lives and ensuring equity of access to information to all residents as a primary foundation of our democracy. Here, here. And with that, oh, I one thing to add is Beverly is happy to answer questions. She, um, some presenters prefer to save them to the end. Beverly is happy to answer them as they come up. So if you have questions and put them in the chat box, I will be monitoring them and we will hopefully get to them. And now I'm going to turn it over to Beverly. Hi, everyone. I'm hoping that you can all see my screen. Uh, if you could let um, anyone know that you cannot in the chat box, that'd be great. I see it, Beverly, so I think you're good. Great, great. This is my first time using this Zoom software also, so uh, I apologize if I fumble around a little bit. Jeremy's been great and Nono's been great also. So uh, welcome today and <clears throat> I'm hoping that you will at least, if nothing else, learn that uh, an experience like this is something that can um, be controlled and sometimes in a very positive way. So I will um, 
get started. The title of this presentation is Ghost Itching and Other Tales of Woe and Wow from the Field, also known as Don't Let the Bed Bugs Bite Your Library. <clears throat> Uh, probably some of you are already itching. Uh, we found that that is a common occurrence, uh, even if there is not a bed bug to be seen. So uh, luckily I can't see you all scratching. And I'm trying to advance my slides. Click in the middle of your uh, slideshow presentation just to give it the focus and then you should be able to change them. Great, thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that if it was not for ALA and the Wichita Public Library's experience with bed bugs, uh, our experience would have uh, resulted in a much more calamitous, um, res it would have been a, a really calamitous. And um, as librarians, we know to look things up when things go uh, wrong. So I did want to give uh, all due credit to the Wichita Public Library for sharing their experience and a lot of what we learned that I will be sharing with you today came directly from their webinar and their PowerPoint. There will be a link to that at the end of the presentation. I will say that all photos of bed bugs in this presentation are from our experience. Um, imagine our surprise and horror when a patron brought an entire travel suitcase full of books with insects to the checkout desk to be returned, except the bugs were not dead. Uh, this is a photo of one of the quarantined items that was returned by one of our patrons. Um, and there's this. So you will see later when we identify bed bugs that uh, we were uh, blessed with the um, books that uh, contained all stages of a bed bug infestation. And then um, this is what I'd like you to think about. Imagine this book being returned in the after hours book drop with hundreds of other books by a different patron during the weekend when the library was closed. This was uh, some of the results that we um, experienced and our reactions. I have to say that uh, the most important resource uh, in this whole uh, saga was the incredible, incredible staff here at Tacoma Public Library. Uh, I can't speak highly enough about them and they are your first line of defense in a similar um, situation. And we are so fortunate to have dedicated um, staff members here who just dug in their heels and um, got over their squeamishness and helped to resolve the problem. Um, here's a little bit about Tacoma Public Library. We serve the third largest city in Washington State. Our population is about 213,000 estimate. We have a very extremely diverse population and a diverse uh, government representation. Our, um, we have uh, people from all ethnic backgrounds in uh, representing us in our city government. We have eight branches throughout the city covering a wide demographic from the very wealthy and upper middle class to working class and desperately poor. Uh, the main library, um, largely handles the working class and desperately poor. And the reason for that is that the library is half, halfway up a large hill that sits between the downtown area and a diverse residential area. We also, which I did not put in the population, um, are surrounded within five square blocks by three shelters uh, serving those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have, uh, this is our building here at the main library. We have two full floors. Uh, the administration is on the top floor and the basement is the work area and staff um, cubicles. And then we have four half floors for um, between the Carnegie side and um, the more modern side in the 1950s. Uh, the first thing I want to do is 
and if nothing else, this is the most important thing uh, in terms of practical experience that hopefully you will get from this uh, webinar, is how to identify a bed bug. I know that uh, many of you are in uh, public libraries and probably other libraries, and uh, we receive, as you know, quite a number of uh, unsuspected um, items when our materials are returned. And sometimes uh, there are insects, sometimes there are other um, unknown objects. Um, so my first task is to let you know what a bed bug looks like. And because of their life cycle, there are varying stages that it's important to know because at any point they can be presented if return materials to the library. Um, I took this from the EPA site, and if you can see on the right, uh, these are the different stages of uh, bed bugs. And uh, the one thing that is the most difficult to see are the eggs. They look like little grains of rice, and you may think that someone just left their dinner in a book. But um, if you see anything that looks like a grain of rice, I would take a second look. And then there are different nymph stages, uh, and you can see in this diagram how they progress. Uh, this is a scale photo. So this was a bed bug that was returned in one of those um, materials that were returned. And you can see this bed bug is a little bit red. This means that the bed bug has fed on a human host. And you can see that it's very small compared to the size of a penny. Uh, these are all the different signs of a bed bug in one photo. Uh, so you can see that there is the actual bed bug on the right. There are droppings, uh, which is the black tarry looking material. And then the varying nymph stages and some eggs. Um, I thought, because we're librarians, it would be interesting to uh, learn some fascinating facts about bed bugs. And uh, some of this will help in determining uh, what stage they're in or how to handle what's going on. Uh, but some of them are just fascinating for fascinate, fascination's sake. <clears throat> uh, bed bugs can survive months without a blood meal, literally months. And they can survive temperatures between freezing and 122 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the temperature will impact how quickly a nymph reaches maturity. And they have a very, very definitive pattern of feeding. So in terms of being bit, the most telltale sign is that there will be a line of bites along the torso usually. Uh, and this is for people who are sleeping, and this usually happens in the home. Uh, when they bite, they inject an anesthetic into the host's skin. This keeps people from being awakened when they are bitten. So they um, have evolved evolutionarily to be able to do their damage without the um, host being aware of it. Uh, they usually feed at night, which actually is a blessing in many ways for a library introduction because typically we do not have patrons here at night. So relatively speaking, the opportunity for them to feed in a library setting is uh, much less than in a home or a hotel. So that was uh, something that I always try to see the positive in things, and this was one positive that I was able to draw from this particular experience that we had. Uh, they cannot fly, but they can travel up to 20 feet or more to find a host. So 20 feet doesn't seem like a long way, but um, it can be, especially if uh, you're in a library setting and they're calling along a stack to find perhaps an unsuspecting either um, host or a place to hide. As I mentioned, a mature uh, bed bug can appear ivory colored if they have not uh, had a blood vest or they can appear brownish red. So when you are trying to identify bed bugs, uh, we made the mistake of thinking um, because of the pictures that the white bed bug 
or the white bug that we saw was not a bed bug because most of the obvious pictures showed them has having already fed. So I wanted to alert you to that, but they can either be that ivory color or a brownish red. Um, Another thing to uh, note is that they are not disease carriers, but scratching can cause an infection. Uh, they can lay hundreds of eggs over their lifetime, but reproduce slowly. They hatch singly and over a few days. I found this to be a fascinating fact, but I don't think it had much to do with uh, how a library can handle it, but I like all these quirky little uh, facts that I can learn about uh, things. to. Uh, help make it a positive experience, at least in terms of acquiring knowledge. Uh, female bed bugs are often injured when mating, and they will move to avoid mating again and are weakened if injured. So I, I would suppose that perhaps a uh, female, if you have an infestation or an introduction into the library, they um, would move around a bit to avoid being injured. And as I mentioned, the casings look like grains of rice. This is where we uh, somewhat were um, puzzled because this is a bed bug nymph. It's probably one of the later stages of nymphs. And because it didn't have that classic bed bug look, we um, spent some time trying to investigate what this was. And, um, and sometimes even uh, waiting a day can make a difference. Um, so I thought that that was important to emphasize that there you should be looking for all of those uh, stages when you're examining materials or your collections. Uh, the immature bed bugs go through six transformations or shedding of skin before reaching adulthood. Uh, they can reproduce as soon as they hatch, which is uh, somewhat problematic. And uh, this was another strange fact. A mature bed bug can reproduce with her offspring. Uh, the bed bug, I'm, I'm going to do this several times, <laughs> sorry. Uh, bed bug droppings are black and tarry. And the black stains from droppings on books without any other evidence are important to note. Other insects do leave black uh, dropping stains, but um, one thing we were taught by the pest control person is to sort of take a gloved finger and wipe it. And if it smears, it's probably not Sharpie marker uh, if you can spread it. Um, since bed bugs only feed, this is really, really, really important to know. Since bed bugs only feed on blood, the cleanliness in a home or a library is not an issue. They can invade the most cleanly homes or businesses. And uh, that's really crucial to know when uh, doing um, your public announcements about what's going on or when talking with patrons who you may need to talk to about uh, some materials that they've returned. Uh, there's a stigma attached to bed bugs that uh, people are dirty or homes are dirty, and that's simply not the case. Uh, they like to hitchhike around, and they are an equal opportunity hitchhiker. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our particular experience here, and <clears throat> Uh, I, I, try, I will try not to go into too much detail, but I think it's important to understand that the different scenarios in which a bed bug can be introduced into a library setting is um, on your radar because it, how you handle it will, um, how you handle an introduction will be largely determined by how the, the bed bugs were introduced. Uh, are there any questions so far? Nope. Nothing's, nothing's come up yet. Okay, thank you, Nono. Sure. Um, in general terms, four patrons from two different branches uh, introduced bed bugs into the library through their returns and checkouts in January, February, and March of 2018. I am going to go back and talk about introduction because this is also important. 
Uh, our pest control company, when they came and evaluated our circumstances, they said that we had an introduction, which sounds oh so much nicer than an infestation. Um, and this was used in our press releases about our circumstances. Um, and it's because of our staff's vigilance and really, um, I, I'll, I'll say it several times, if our staff was not the great staff that we have here, this would have been much more um, catastrophic than it was. So the official term for what happened to us was an introduction. And that means that the pests were introduced into our setting, but because we were able to contain it, uh, it still remained an introduction instead of an infestation. I know that sounds a little weird, but language is so important in um, uh, communicating with the public about what's going on. Again, four patrons from two different branches um, introduced uh, bed bugs. We learned uh, from our uh, pest control expert that actually there was a large outbreak of bed bugs in the entire city of Tacoma from the wealthiest sections to uh, the shelters uh, for those experiencing homelessness. There was, I don't know if it was cyclical, which they implied there was some cyclical nature to um, an outbreak of a lot of bed bug uh, in infestations and introductions. Um, it could be the weather. Uh, but there was a large, large, large number um, of outbreaks throughout the city during these three months. One thing that will happen as you, um, if not when, but if you happen to encounter this is that a lot of um, back and forth will take place about who caused it. Did the patron introduce it to the library or did the library spread it through um, the circulation of their materials. And as public agencies, we our goal is to send things out into the public. So I would argue that it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, there's no way we can go back and say where the um, origination is for uh, someone that might uh, encounter a bed bug um, situation in their living quarters or at the library. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, just to tell you and relate to you how important it is to um, kind of detect this pretty early on. Uh, we did have a one day delay, which doesn't seem like much, but it was monumental in terms of how we had to handle uh, the introduction. Uh, so back in January, while well, late January, uh, one page was, uh, we, we have amazing pages here at Tacoma Library. They are so meticulous and so good at what they do. And they do all of the check-in material of materials from the book drops and from our interior drops and delivery from our other branches. And they examine each and every item. We have a large collection and a lot of materials that go back and forth as do many uh, urban libraries or county libraries. And they are so good at doing their due process before checking an item in. And uh, one of our pages noted, thankfully, dead insects. And uh, they bagged the items according to our damage procedure and then referred them to the staff that handles damage. Uh, as I said, we took a little bit, almost a day, to identify the, the bugs and the nymphs. Unfortunately, um, the rest of the material in the book drops had been processed. So uh, the worst case scenario is a person uh, returning an infected item into the book drop uh, because the potential is there to contaminate the rest of the materials from other patrons. Uh, we checked the patron's record and saw that several other items were checked out. Uh, and so this was a very difficult conversation to have um, throughout this process. And as the manager, it was my responsibility to intersect with and um, talk with the patrons about what had happened. And I have to say, I, it was the um, 
it was that webinar and PowerPoint from uh, ALA that helped me to know how to navigate this. So I'm sharing that with you. Again, uh, treating the pat uh, patron with compassion, uh, talking to them and explaining to them that it's not a reflection on their hygiene or the high, uh, cleanliness of their homes. And then it also helped to um, let them know that, um, and it didn't happen with this patron because they were the first one, but by the time we got to our fourth patron, uh, we were able to say that they were not alone and that there was a large outbreak in the city at the time. So we did uh, call the patron and asked him to return the materials to the checkout desk in plastic bags. We weren't sure if the rest of them were um, infected, but we wanted to err on the safe side. And the, this patron was amazing. He complied with every request that we made. He had the best interest of the rest of the city and the library collection at heart. And Oh, he was just amazing. So um, you'll encounter a variety of responses to when you uh, let patrons know what's going on. We immediately called maintenance as soon as we figured out what um, had happened. Uh, and that was the next day. And we had them thoroughly vacuum the closet where our night drop materials uh, were returned. Um, on February 2nd, the second and third introductions occurred, coincidentally not, by two patrons who lived in the same apartment complex. This was probably the most horrifying experience of the whole um, saga in that an elderly patron brought a carry-on roller suitcase with about a dozen books and propped it up on the desk, opened the top, and the entire suitcase was teeming with crawling bed bugs, and the books were all covered. Um, our circulation uh, assistant the, um, at the desk was very, very quick thinking um, and uh, bagged all the books, called uh, the supervisor, and um, it was also observed that the patron had bed bugs crawling on his clothing and several bites on his face and hands. Um, interestingly, this patron, uh, I'll relay uh, the outcome of our interactions with him, but it's really a testament to the power of the library about how this particular transaction went with this gentleman. Um, so again, the circulation supervisor was called, and then I called this patron because he had already left, um, and I noticed a typo there, I'm sorry. Uh, I informed him that he would not be permitted in the library unless his apartment was professionally treated. Uh, we had uh, done some research, and because his suitcase was so infested, it was clear that his entire premises were, and he was really literally covered with bed bugs on his body. So we expired his card and then uh, stated that he would talk to his landlord. We manually discarded the materials that were still checked out to him and asked him to not return them to the library, but to discard them in the trash. On that same day, a third patron, an elderly woman, returned books with what appeared to be stains on them. The circulation assistant, this was a different one, uh, noted the stains, double bagged them, and referred them to the person assigned to damage. Uh, once you, they were um, brought to damage, the two books were found to have live bed bugs hiding in between the spine and the dust jacket, which is a notorious place for them to lurk. And so then the circulation staff came to me and I um, found out that she lived in the same complex as the man who was there earlier in the day. Uh, I called the patron and asked her to call me. Instead, she came to my office. I had no idea who she was, and she came and sat in my office. Um, and when she was here, I told her that she would not be permitted in the library until her apartment had been 
treated uh, according to recommended practices. Um, as soon as she left, I found two bed bugs on the back of the chair where she was sitting and one was crawling up the wall of my office. Because of the research I had done, um, I discarded the chair and spot treated my, al my office with alcohol and diatomaceous earth, which I had um, learned about in the WLA presentation or the uh, ALA presentation and also some other research I had done until we could get a professional pest control um, official in. Uh, she stated that her landlord, as well as the landlord of the gentleman from before, they were the same person, and she doubted that he would spend the money, but she agreed to comply. Over the weekend, even though I had asked her to return the materials at the desk in a plastic bag, uh, she put them unbagged in the book drop, which we discovered the next morning after a long weekend. Additionally, two weeks later, she returned the last book by mail from a different location than her apartment complex, so we suspect that she had actually moved out of the apartment. I should note in here that I talked to two landlords with the permission of the patrons, and they. Um, one uh, of the landlords was already aware of the problem and was having it professionally treated. That was for the first patron. And then the second landlord refused to acknowledge that there was an issue. Um, I would never have called them without the, the patron's permission. But since they gave me permission and because their library privileges uh, being restored was dependent upon getting professional treatment at uh, their locations, it was one of the more difficult conversations that I, as I said, it was difficult to have that conversation with them. And um, I felt that the best thing to do was to really um, let the landlords know that their uh, tenants would not be permitted back into the library to somehow um, let them know how important it was for their complexes to be uh, treated. Any questions so far? So uh, we you, did. you have a comment, just a comment, Beverly, which says, I have to say, this is great information and I am getting itchy. <laughs> <laughs> there is an actual term for it. It's called ghost stitching. And to be honest, after it's now July and the entire staff here was ghost stitching for about three or four months. It, um, Wait, and even bet. when I was preparing the presentation, um, I probably actually was itching when I made that typo and got distracted, so I apologize. <laughs> um, yes, it is something, and uh, but it will go away, I promise. <laughs> so I found this to be a very uh, interesting um, graphic. Uh, and I think that uh, it's probably hyperbolic, but that's how we felt at the time. And I can say that um, it really, really is important um, to kind of know how to react. And, uh, but I was, you know, a lot of us were in just a state of shock. And we could, uh, once we did the research and knowing the life cycle of the bed bugs, we were uh, just not sure how to proceed. And again, the ALA um, webinar was really, really helpful. Um, so here is what we did. And uh, we would do some things differently if now that we know, but we did, I believe, the best job we could in the circumstances. So as I said, the first job was to identify the first insects and hopefully you have some information there to help you identify them. As I said, it didn't occur to the following day. Uh, any materials in the drop that might have cross contaminated other materials had been processed, shelved, and sent out to other branches. So that was where my biggest concern was. It was easy to sort of just kill the live bugs in the material in the books and that we saw that had clear evidence, but I was concerned about 
uh, hitchhikers and lurkers going out to all of our branches. Um, and here's the link, and it's also at the end of the presentation. Uh, the most important piece of advice I got from this particular um, webinar and PowerPoint from ALA was, don't panic. And I tend to be a worrier and a warrior, so uh, both of my instincts kicked into gear. Um, and I really, really tried to not panic and also to convey a sense of if we were methodical in our approach, because I had to also quell the panic and fears and squeamishness and uh, and ooh and oh uh, of the staff in those first days. So the main thing you can do is not panic and know that there's a way to resolve this if you act quickly. Um, and I, that's a repeat slide. Okay, so though pages and other staff are excellent at detecting problems, we learned that the best way to detect bugs that might not otherwise show evidence. One staff, and I'm not sure if you do this in your libraries, but uh, we like to have our staff uh, pages wear gloves when they are processing materials because bed bugs are just one of many uh, ways for um, uh, unpleasant things to transfer to skin. Um, we have a tiled basement where we process our materials and I know that some libraries don't have that, they have carpet. I can tell you that uh, having carpet is, um, while processing materials is not um, ideal because if egg casings or nymphs drop into the carpet, they're just going to burrow there. Here is the biggest tip that I can give you for how to discover them. I will say that hardcover books in CD and DVD cases are um, the most um, sought after homes by uh, tran transient bed bugs. And what they will do is they will climb in between the vinyl covers, dust jacket, and the spine of the book and they will burrow in there or they'll burrow between the spine and the signatures. They also like to crawl up under the vinyl book flaps and park themselves there. And uh, one way to determine, and now our normal procedures for every hardcover book that comes into the library is to squeeze along the spine of them with dust dust jackets and this will force any live bugs to move to the top and bottom of the spine. I'll bet you're all itching again. Uh, another thing is to open up the CD cases and DVDs and look under the flaps and then it's uh, important to know that paperbacks are less likely to harbor the insects because there's no real crevices for them to hide in. Uh, immediately quarantine any materials containing evidence of contamination. Uh, this was already a part of our procedures and it is because of the vigilance of our pages and circulation staff that we were able to act on this so quickly. So if you don't have uh, insect control in your library, I would uh, recommend that um, you institute them. Uh, we were told by the pest control people who eventually came that the best thing for bed bugs is to double bag them with Ziploc bags. Don't just rely on a single uh, bag because the smaller uh, nymphs can crawl through the zips in the Ziploc bag. Uh, the other thing we did was we communicated immediately the following day after the first introduction with all staff at the branches that there had been an introduction. We of course, contacted our director and building manager immediately. And our building manager contacted a pest, con a pest control professional um, until they could get there because they weren't able to get there right away, the pest control people. We did the best we could with uh, alcohol. I actually got 99% alcohol and then diatomaceous earth. We were very concerned about using toxic materials in the library until the pest control people could get there. So uh, we knew that the books that were brought in the suitcase were not salvageable, but we um, wanted to keep them so we could make sure that um, they were all properly discarded and re um, removed from our ILS system. 
Um, the alcohol dries out their um, skeletons and skin, and then the diatomaceous earth, when they crawl on it and um, touch themselves, it's kind of cruel, but it um, scratches their underbelly, so um, it actually injures the insects. Um, so those were our two first lines of defense. The night that we decided that they were bed bugs, I went out and bought a gigantic bag of the diatomaceous earth and a couple of bottles of actually 99% alcohol. Uh, I sprayed um, the book drop in addition to the maintenance people being meticulous about vacuuming and uh, with the alcohol, we wiped it down uh, and we sprinkled diatomaceous earth in the bags with some cut up sponges. I don't know if it really helped to kill them, but it made us feel better. And uh, we did notice that most of any living things did drop out dead from those bags. Uh, we treated all upholstered furniture, book drops, and bins until the best pest control company could arrive. The best thing to do is really deeply vacuum everything. Uh, we treated over 300 items from the book drop, even though there was no evidence because they had come in contact with the two books that did have uh, live bed bugs that we discovered. And then we visually inspected all the stack areas near the materials that were checked out by the three patrons here for signs of uh, infestation or introduction. So fortunately, these patrons were creatures of habit and they always um, borrowed the same authors. Uh, so that helped to minimize it. There was a couple of non-fictions, but they were really largely fiction readers in the James Patterson, Debbie McCumber, uh, those types of um, materials. So we looked at their checkouts that they currently had, we looked at the materials that they returned, and then we went and visually inspected rows of shelves uh, near those items that had been borrowed, uh, given the information on how to detect bed bugs in their life cycles. Um, Beverly, this is Nono, and I have a, a question that you, I, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that two of the people who returned um, infest or introduced, whatever you use the right term, well, return, I, return materials that were that had bed bugs were from the same building. And I yes. wondered, I don't really know what what the right response would be, but I wondered if you considered or did contact other patrons who lived in that building to be on the lookout or, or marked it in any way so that you could help control that? Or I don't know if that is a we, patron privacy issue, but it was one of the thoughts that came to my head when you said that. Nope, that's a great question. So the, the one landlord that I called with the very compliant uh, patron, he was already aware of the problem and had already been treating. So they were in the first stage of treatment. I guess the treatment stages go in three. They have to initially treat, then they come back and do a spot check and treat again, and then they do a final inspection to make sure that everything is clear. And uh, the landlord for the first patron uh, was already in stage one of that. So he had already informed the, um, the residents of that apartment complex. That was a larger uh, apartment complex. I think there were eight um, units in that one. The second patron uh, without uh, uh, violating their confidentiality, they were, it was an elderly couple in an old Victorian who were letting out their two um, bedrooms on the top floor. So the two patrons lived next door to one another and they were the only residents aside from the um, landlord and his wife. So in those two instances, the landlord was completely in denial about what was happening. And uh, when I spoke to him, he was, I felt bad because he was, he was an elderly gentleman and this was their home. And I could hear his wife shouting at him in the background saying, you know, I've told you we need to take care of this. We need to take care of this. And he was just completely denying that there was an issue. And that was for the two other patrons. 
Uh, for the patron from the branch, uh, they called that particular um, patron, and that patron was actually in um, a single family home. So they were very appreciative. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yes, it did. And, and it, another question came in when uh -huh. we were talking, it, which said, what if you found evidence of bed bugs on one item only and that patron had no other items checked out? Is there a minimum to act on? I think that if you find a bed bug, because you don't know if they're the, we, if you find a single bed bug, you should still act because you don't know if it's pregnant or laid eggs any place. So say if it was returned in the book drop, it may have laid eggs in the book drop that could hatch and contaminate anything else. Uh, if it's only in the book and the patron returns it to the desk, you don't know if it's laid eggs at the home where they might have other material. You said if they don't have materials checked out. So I would definitely uh, let the patron know that it was found just as we would anyway for any damaged item. Uh, we sort of, uh, we wrestled with how much damage would be acceptable for keeping materials in the collection. Clearly the ones that came in the suitcase that had those varying every single possible stage and that were crawling all over the suitcase and all over the poor gentleman. Um, we kept them con contained and quarantined, but only so that we could um, figure out uh, what to do with them. And we didn't know if they could be, if any of them could be salvaged. So we put the, the pest control people put new van strips in, which I'll talk about, uh, in each of those gigantic bags. And it, we, in the end, we decided just to um, destroy all of the materials that that gentleman had uh, borrowed and the ones from the, the woman because we knew that that place was um, highly, and in that case, it would be termed infested, that particular uh, two apartment complex. But I would say, yeah, it's best to just be cautious. If you see something, do something. And even if it's something as simple as putting it in a bag with um, diatomaceous earth and uh, an alcohol sponge and then contacting the patron. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Great. Um, so the pest control company came and they spot treated the most likely areas that we had actually marked with post-it notes based on our analysis of what the patrons had um, uh, borrowed. And they placed what are called volcanoes in these areas. I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, they also placed new van strips in the quarantined items in bags that showed evidence, i.e. those are the ones directly from the patrons. After examination of all the other materials in the book drops and the bins, uh, we bagged those in gigantic uh, clear garbage bags along with uh, double bagging in um, Ziploc bags with sponges and diatomaceous earth, which is just a powder and it can, uh, it gets brushed off. So we left those in the bag for over a month. We um, suppressed them in the catalog so people couldn't borrow them. But there were um, 300 items that we treated that way. And we actually put all but two of those back in the collection after a month. Uh, these are the volcanoes over on the left. And what you do is you put those out in the uh, stacks where there might be evidence of bed bugs. And they have a hormone in there that attracts the uh, females. Uh, and then the ones on the left are actually uh, uh, designed to kill any uh, bed bugs. They're little strips that we put in the bags. The, the actual volcanoes don't kill anything. That's just a way to lure them out of the books. And um, so we uh, placed 15 of those around the library in areas where the patrons had borrowed materials from that particular author or genre and so, or a subject in the nonfiction section. Um, so uh, when the 
woman that brought the books that came into my office and returned two badly infested books in the book drop, and this was the second book drop, we weren't sure if we had caught everything in the collection, and we knew that even if we missed a single book, it could escalate. So our building manager and I uh, um, talked to our director, and she decided to hire bedbug sniffing dogs to scan the entire six floors of the main library. The earliest the dog and hand, hand and it turned out there were two dogs, um, could arrive was on a Sunday, and the decision was made to close the main branch uh, for three days on, so that any contaminated, contaminated items would stay at the library, this branch, and not be sent out to other branches or filled holds, or for people to um, come in and un, uh, unintentionally take home bed bugs with them. So uh, this was the most important thing that I think that we did. We announced the closure on our website and Facebook page, but the press release explaining exactly why we were closing. In my research of other libraries that have encountered this, uh, the libraries, um, and this is because nobody had experience, but some libraries were reluctant to make a public announcement for fear of impact on the library and we decided with some guidance from the ALA webinar that the best thing to do is just be upfront about why we were closing and let people know and that was in the best interest of our uh, the patrons and our public in the city of Tacoma. So we put this web uh, press release up on our banner on our website stating that the main library would be closed because of an introduction of bed bucks bed bugs and that we were doing this um, with the utmost caution and that um, we were really just trying to be proactive about it and uh, if nothing if you do nothing else if you have this the best thing is to be open and honest with the public and we were not sure what the fallout will be would be but um, I can I'll be talking about that in a little in a few minutes um, Beverly, a comment came in um, that I wanted to read before you move on it, which um, someone said the return procedures that you described seemed very time consuming, especially if there are high checkout volumes and limited staff. They are very time consuming. Uh, so, um, but we would just think a large part of our um, collection is not um, paperback. So, uh, we would spend less time on those. And after a while, the squeezing, it just became the squeezing of the spine. It just became part of the normal checking of procedures. So our, dam uh, our pages are trained to, you know, look for items in the book that are left to look for damage. Uh, and then just doing that squeeze up the spine, opening up the book and fanning it out is a good way to have anything drop out. And again, the tile floor is really crucial. Uh, if you have carpeted floors, I would recommend putting down tarps. It is time consuming, but it uh, really saved us in the long run because those procedures had already been in place. The only thing we weren't doing was the squeezing of the spine. So if you think, and if you don't have the staff to do that, that's certainly understandable. But if there's any um, suspicion, then I would recommend instituting those more uh, detailed procedures like squeezing the spine and fanning. And I was the director of a very, very small library in upstate New York. So I certainly understand the staffing restraints. And we also have uh, three very small branches here where they only have one page. So. Uh, they just would slog their way through it. And so we, um, you know, we have to remind them sometimes that they still need to do the spine uh, testing, mainly because they, because of the life cycle of the bed bugs, there could be some potentially hiding eggs, as I explained, that takes a long, over a longer period of time for the eggs to hatch and to reproduce. And since the, um, Females can uh, reproduce with their offspring. 
we're still being very cautious. I would say maybe we don't need to be that meticulous um, going forward, but since we're still within the first six months, we are being, we're erring on the side of being overly cautious. So these are the two, did that answer the question? I think so. Um, so these are the two uh, drugs, or not drug, <laughs> bed bug sniffing dogs that uh, came. And we had to wait, as I said, so we closed the library for three days, the branch. We left the rest of the branches open. And these dogs were amazing. They did all six floors in a single day. And they just know exactly what they're doing. They go up and if they alert to something, they will sit on their haunches and just sit there. Their sense of smell gets uh, somewhat uh, dulled over the course of the morning. So the handler would switch the dogs off and on so they could and take them outside so they can uh, have a different um, sense of smell and come back in and be fresh. Uh, she would re-prime um, them to go look. She had bed bugs in a um, canister that had holes in it, and she would uh, throw it to them to resensitize their um, noses after they were um, working for probably about an hour. So she would redo that and then trade off the dog. So the one on the left is Pistol Pete, and the one on the right is Spike. Um, so I'm just going to go through our outcomes and what I learned today, what we learned. Um, I know I only have about four minutes, but um, you can read these earlier. So the, the thing that we learned was the volcanoes only attracted one uh, bed bug. That was great. Uh, the dogs only alerted to five books in one of our sofas, uh, and they couldn't find any evidence in the sofa. The dogs did go to all of our other branches, and uh, they did not find any bed bugs in any of the other branches. Uh, the female patron, as I mentioned, we just got rid of that chair, and I now have a metal chair in my office. Um, the first man just returned last month. He was the one whose uh, landlord was very compliant, and uh, he was so excited to come back with the certificate from of his apartment being clean. So we restored all of his privileges. Um, the woman, we think, moved out of the apartment from the second apartment that was really infested because we think that's why she mailed her remaining books back. Uh, the elderly second man was devastated. He was, he was the one that had the suitcase. So what we did um, was to take uh, paperbacks from our book sale and staff all contributed money to buy him some books and he would come to the front door and um, we would actually give him books from our book sale so he would have something to read. He was so upset about the landlord not um, doing anything that he contacted his social services counselor and they found him a new place. After he brought us the change of address, uh, they helped him getting new clothing and all of that. So he destroyed everything, his furniture, and they got him a new apartment and he came back and uh, we restored all of his borrowing. Um, any infected books with uh, any evidence were put in the trash. We decided just not to take any chances. Uh, we kept track of the books uh, that were discarded. This is an important factor. We did not charge the patrons for any of these books. Uh, we talked about it and we decided that this was sort of a natural disaster such as having a fire or some other circumstance. And we figured that they were already um, much more, um, uh, had enough problems without us charging materials. And for the elderly man, he would never have been able to afford the, um, I think it was seven to $800 worth of materials he had borrowed. So we just waived those charges. We alerted collection development about things that needed to be replaced. Um, 
Uh, I've already said many of these things. Um, we had key staff who appointed themselves as willing to handle the impacted materials and the custodians went above and beyond in hyper cleaning the branches. Uh, they said we had done an in outstanding job of quarantining and taking action early, which really helped to mitigate against further spread. Um, and then our library visits weren't actually negatively impacted. In fact, we had our largest attendance of the year the day that we reopened after the three days. And people asked questions and we were just honest with them. Uh, we made a, um, the dogs were brought back in April to all eight branches and there was no, no bed bugs were detected. And as part of the plan, we're bringing them back every quarter just to make sure. So this is a keep calm and kill bed bugs. Act quickly, and uh, I'll make the slides available. I know we're running low on time. Uh, um, place and uh, item. Beverly, actually, we are, we are recording this, so if anyone, if if you have the time, don't feel rushed. We will oh, record it, and anyone who's attending will get a link to the recording. So if you need to oh, move great. off to be on the desk, we'll you'll get the recording. And, and great, thank you. I'm happy sure. to continue. Um, okay. So uh, act quickly uh, the minute you think you have an introduction. Uh, place item level holds on those items that have been checked out by these patrons and um, so that they won't go to fill a hold at another person's uh, branch who may not have bed bugs. So we called in everything else that was borrowed and still checked out by the four patrons. Um, Contact the patron immediately if something's been uh, returned in a book drop or a bin and double bag anything that they want to return back to the library and bring it to the checkout desk. Decontaminate all the books, drops, and bins on a daily basis while you still have an introduction. We don't do this anymore because um, we got cleared in April from the dogs. One little Tip, don't buy cheap spray bottles at the dollar store because the alcohol melts the spray um, mechanism at the top. Uh, use sensitivity and compassion in explaining the issue. Um, this was the hardest part was to um, really exclude the patron from the library until they could provide evidence that their home has been treated. Um, and uh, recommend alternate ways to serve the patrons, like telling them how to download ebooks or, um, you know, allowing some, allowing them to purchase some of your um, sale books. We purchased them for this um, gentleman. Uh, don't pretend the problem doesn't exist. Answer the patron questions with uh, honesty, and then keep the public informed is really important, so they can come prevent contamination on their own. Again, it goes back to what comes first, the chicken or the egg. So they will know how to seek this out in their own homes or living quarters uh, because, again, it's impossible to tell where it starts. Um, remain vigilant. Uh, don't panic. Um, I'm going to close with this. Uh, try to have a sense of humor about all of this. Uh, we're all teasing each other about itching. Um, and now I'm itching myself. <laughs> uh, prior to our all staff meeting this past spring, a staff member wrote a future billboard hit, the Biblio Bedbug Blues. And I have the lyrics to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, the ghost itching will go away eventually. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, and this is for staff, uh, if you encounter this, and this is probably a good idea even if you don't, what we were told by the pest control um, company was do not wash your clothes when you get home from work. Take them and put them in the dryer on hot when you get home from work. So every day when I would go home during this, I would take off all my clothes at the front door, put them in a bag, and then put them in the dryer on hot because they cannot survive over 120 degrees. So your dryer usually is 140 degrees if it's on the hot setting. So that will help to kill any eggs or uh, creepy crawlies that might have gotten in your clothes. And because the woman was in my office and there was bed bugs left in my office, I was vigilant about that for about a month. 
And here is the Biblio Bedbug Blues right here. So I won't read through all the lyrics, but um, they're, well, maybe I will since I have time. I've traveled all around the world from one coast to the next. And now I spend my days in a place I did not expect. I usually hide away in tiny little nooks. Now I'm surrounded by some marvelous things. I live in a world of books, but I'm scared and I'm nervous and I don't know what to do. I guess I'm just not wanted here. I've got those biblio bed bug blues. They're sending in the dogs. They're trying to get rid of me, but I've only been to a few shelves and there's so much more to see. Me and my, my big brother feasted on 1984, had to eat the manga backwards, and now my throat is sore. Yeah, I'm scared and I'm nervous and I don't know what to do. Even though I'm getting more educated, I've got the biblio bed bug blues. It hasn't all been positive. Sorry, that's how I feel. I thought it was crust, turned out to be rust on the pages of Danielle Steele. Then I tried some other authors to sit back and have some fun. Ended up with the empty calories of James Patterson. I'm going to hide here on this shelf. It's getting kind of scary here. I'll be ready when that dog swoops. I'll hide my durier in the rarefied air of everybody poops. I'll live happily ever after going from one shelf to the next. Have I mentioned I hate James Patterson? I'll get over those bed bug blues. That's and here's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, we they we all brought our guitars to our all staff meeting and we sang that at lunch. So um, <laughs> it was it was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, so here are some resources, and um, again, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that Bessie Smith did a nice version of Mean Old Bed Bug Blues, and you can see that on YouTube. I've talked about a lot of the things in the other resources here, so I thank you for your attention, and uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact me feel free at any time to call or contact me and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have either here now or uh, via email or phone. So Beverly, this is Nona again. And um, if you would send me those resources, we can put them up with a on YouTube so that people can link directly to them. And then Great. we had we had one more comment I wanted to read for you said um, at the public library where I worked, there was a huge outbreak. We ended up purchasing these compartments, if you will, that had heaters and fans and everything, all caps, that came in, went through them for some time. We had an expert come in and train us. The one thing I would say for anyone is what you said to the one panelist. If you see one, then assume you have an issue to address. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. That option was actually brought to our attention, and we were going to uh, do that, um, but the, there were so many stains on the books uh, that were returned because they were so heavily infected that uh, we thought we might salvage some of them, but um, we decided they were so badly damaged, the best thing to do would be to put them in the uh, trash and just get rid of them entirely. So we did, uh, thank you for bringing that up. We did consider the, the oven, uh, but we decided against it just because the things were so badly damaged. Anything that had any evidence, we just got rid of. Um, but that is an additional option, uh, which I should have mentioned. Any other questions? And I'd love to hear about how you handled uh, the experience too, whoever that particular commenter was. Um, this has been fascinating and boy, kudos to your staff. I can only imagine how, like, how they must have felt coming to work every day. Oh, they yeah. are, they are really just amazing about everything. You know, we live, we work in a very, um, as I said, a very kind of difficult, our, our library is, halfway between a uh, residential area and downtown area and um, our regular patrons are largely patrons from our um, homeless shelters that are along our street. And then when we have special programs, we will get other demographics in. 
interestingly, the um, the youth, young adult shelter that's about two blocks from here, they had an outbreak at that particular um, shelter, and uh, they come and sit on our uh, teen furniture, and uh, so we've been uh, vigilant about the upholstery, and we're looking into getting less uh, less uh, what's the word uh, receptive homes for bed bugs um, but everybody that had an introduction actually lived in an apartment complex and you know the thing that we think about is every single day people walk into our branch and we don't know what is coming in with them when we encounter a situation it's important to address it as soon as possible recognize that it's not the patrons fault and that we um, should treat patrons with compassion and caring and welcome them back with open arms when the problem has been resolved which we've done here so um, except for the woman that we think moved to a different county to live with her sister both of our um, patrons are back using the library and come and visit and uh, we just treat them as if this never happened. I really love that your staff pitched in to buy books for that gentleman. I think yes. that's a really, that's again, it's another testament to your staff and how much they care. And then now he, now that he's back in, he says, no, I'm paying for them now. So, <laughs> so you just had another comment, Beverly, what a great presentation and what a huge ordeal to go through. I love finding out about bed bugs sniffing dogs. I did too. Yeah. I really appreciate the recording and look forward to sharing it with my team. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll correct a couple of the um, typos. I was uh, finishing this up yesterday, and uh, we have uh, some people working on our property, and they kept blowing the circuit, and I could not. I kept getting up and down, and I thought I had double checked it, but I apologize. I would guess that every single person on this webinar right now has made typos in their PowerPoint, <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it. Well, thank you. And again, if you have any questions at all, um, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I'm not sure that the Appalachian Biblio Bedbug Librarian is one that I would have chosen, but I'm happy to wear it proudly because our staff did such a great job of handling the situation. Another comment. Thank you so much, Beverly. You are a warrior. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Beverly. This is amazing. Oh, you're very and welcome. Hopefully information that none of us will need. But yes, if, we do, so. <laughs> if, if, we, if we do, we will have it. So thank Forewarned you, everyone. Forewarned is forearmed. <laughs> yeah.